I swept in at a time when there was a big cultural change that had taken place here. From wholly running everything to now all of a sudden, it's young, inexperienced Japanese. Our, our 442nd heroes and the likes of that. And, and, and life changed totally in this community. At 92 years of age, Will Henderson has seen a lot of changes in the world. Today, this retired Hawaii healthcare executive is still working out at two gyms and still willing to share advice with up and comers. Will Henderson, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Will Henderson grew up in poverty and isolation on the plains of South Dakota and worked in the sawmills of Oregon to pay for college. Through hard work and education, he bettered his circumstances and earned a master's degree in hospital management, which was a brand new field in the 1950s. In Hawaii, the year 1959 was a milestone as we became the 50th state. With the Democratic Revolution of 1954, the leadership and status quo throughout the islands began to change. This was the backdrop as Will Henderson, a young hospital executive from the UCLA Medical Center, was recruited to save the struggling Kaui Keolani Children's Hospital. While Will came to Hawaii intending to make major changes to the hospital, it was the people of Hawaii who forever changed his life. I think I can say this without even a second thought. Everything I am and everything I've learned, I learned in Hawaii because it brought a whole new dimension to my life that I didn't know anything about. Different cultures, different beliefs, different religions, uh, different lifestyles that I had never seen or anything. I somehow or other was fortunate enough to get into a new career that was being developed in the United States, and that was hospital management. And, and we had the opportunity of seeing things so differently uh, than in Hawaii. Hawaii was uh, a magnificent, lovely place, but 15 to 20 years behind healthcare in, in every aspect. And the opportunity then of coming here, what a magnificent gift, what a magnificent challenge. Will Henderson's first challenge in Hawaii was getting the troubled Children's Hospital out of bankruptcy. With strict financial controls and his new approach to hospital management, things began to turn around rather quickly. And it started with the medical staff. And I was saying to the medical staff, uh, the president of the medical staff was a big strapping young guy in pediatrics. And I was saying to him, you know, we've got to find a way to uh, make this hospital whole again. And I said, it, uh, the medical staff is the key. If you don't bring patients, it doesn't make any difference what we do, we cannot uh, succeed. And so, Magnificent as he was, he was with Straub Clinic. Uh, he said, we, we, we'll back you up, we'll work with you. And we started then. In nine months, we had recovered the $100,000 that we owed the bank. In 1961, Will Henderson became president and CEO of the Queen's Hospital, a post that he would hold until his retirement in 1983. Will set out to update Queens into the modern healthcare center that it is today. And so a Malahini was put in charge of a medical center whose, whose mission really is to provide quality health services to improve the welfare, the well-being of the native Hawaiian people and all the people of Hawaii. But it has, it has a native Hawaiian mission. Yep. Started by royalty, Queen uh, Emma. We were at, at 101 years, we were a long way from your description. A long, long way from it. Mind you, the, the healthcare system here in the hospitals 
not saying the doctors, in the, in the hospitals, 20, 20 years behind time. There was nothing going on that every person knows today. There was not a single intensive care unit in this community when I came here. Everybody is treated on outpatient care now. I started that outpatient care in this community in hospitals. Never done. Well, it's about 19... 67, 68. Are you saying that it was all or nothing? They either took you as a patient to stay over or, or they didn't treat you? It, you're, you went to a doctor's office. That was the only place you got to, you're not an outpatient. Or you could have gone to the Queen Anne clinics, but most patients were not going there. Those, Did those you have trauma centers? You know, you know that no there trauma, trauma center, ah. no. Well, we did have a, at Queen's, an emergency department, but it was not a trauma center. It was a far cry from that. How, so did you <clears throat> help bring it along to, to make up those 20 years of lag? We changed it. We redirected from a hospital and started the move toward a medical center. Through Will Henderson's leadership, the Queen's Hospital was transformed into the Queen's Medical Center in 1967. Will credits his success at Queens and in Hawaii to the multicultural friendships he made. Not only did his new friends acquaint him with the island lifestyle and the Pacific Asian cultures, they also accepted Will into their families. In turn, Will embraced and accepted their cultures and their families. As you know, a lot of people who come to um, who, who've had great success other places and come to Hawaii to take jobs. Often they just, it's not their cup of tea. They don't, um, they don't cotton to the culture. They have a hard time fitting in. They feel, some feel unwelcome. I, I, yeah. This may not be true. And, I mean, I'm not making a gross generalization, but this has been a, a pattern of sorts. It is true. It's very true because I had a problem keeping executives here because the wife would be very unhappy and they'd go back. But what made it so easy for you? I swept in at a time when there was a big cultural change that had taken place here, from wholly running everything to now all of a sudden it's young, inexperienced Japanese, uh, our 442nd heroes and the likes of that. And, and, and life changed totally in this community, uh, whether most people realize it or not. But, but when, you're, when you're integrated into the, the total society, you see things much differently. And uh, it, it's with great pride that I became close friends with all of these people, whether they are Filipino, Chinese, Japanese, Hawaiian, whatever it might be. Uh, there are many, many close friends. And, and so I got here in a doctor by the name of Dr. David Pang, he's a pediatrician. He delivered me. Well, then you, <laughs> he did the right thing at the right time because he delivered me as well. How so? 38 years old, I didn't know a single thing about getting along any place uh, in Hawaii. He took me under his wing and he started counseling me about all kinds of circumstances and individual things to be aware of. Dr. David Pang was my friend to the very day of his death. And he always kept advising me and I would constantly thank him for doing this. And he said, I didn't do anything for you. And then now I've got the Hawaii side, I mean the Hawaiian side. Now I've sort of got the Chinese side. And my very first close friend was Dr. Clifford Kobayashi, pediatrician again, that came in and he had four daughters, four little girls. And I became a part of that family. And today I'm still family with them. As a matter of fact, I just talked to mother yesterday. All of a sudden, I have a cadre of people taking care of me and showing me how to get along in this community. And I still didn't know 
then I'm supposed to be working with the Howleys all of the time. Yeah, you can chuckle about that a little bit. That, it's a problem. So that's, and it really did boil down to a, a Caucasian uh, triumvirate, I mean, a, a ruling party. Is that how it boiled it, down to? It was at that time, absolutely. Everything was. But I had friends then that came along and developed along on the Howley side as well. A couple of them even being in legislators. And early on, I met, uh, I, I had a telephone call from a senator. And that senator, um, later I met him. Became very good friends. I, 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 I very fond of him and his wife, George Ariyoshi. George Ariyoshi was a wonderful friend to me, helped me in many ways. Uh, if nothing else, just being a friend in a Japanese controlling community now. And so as I just progressed through each of these groups, think about it, to be a Haole in this community at a time that it had changed from being run by Haoles to now basically the Japanese Democratic Party is in control of everything. So now I'm setting pretty good, huh? I, uh, Sounds like it. I've got the community. I'm acquainted with all of the community and, and everything. But now when you take Queens, now Queens Medical Center, it's almost 100% Howley board. And many of the people. So finally I got a, a, a young Chinese lady on the board. And uh, then there are a couple of uh, more that we managed to bring onto the board. Now, I have to say to you, in my board, there was no prejudice. They, they were, I, I think that somewhere in the system, someone dealt out a hand of cards and said, okay, you're Chinese, you're Japanese, you're this, and you all live together and work together. Will Henderson retired after 22 years as the president and CEO of the Queen's Medical Center. For many years in retirement, he continued to serve on boards and in community leadership positions. Over the years, he's had an audience with world leaders such as the Crown Prince of Japan, the Queen of Thailand, and the King of Jordan. Will still spends his time passing on his wisdom to aspiring or successful business and community leaders. You, um, you're known for mentoring people. You're generous with your time and your wisdom. You, you, uh, you take time to listen and you, you make um, some very um, strategic comments. Um, what kind of advice are you giving out these days? Can you give us an example? First, let me say that I have 51 protégés. Two of them became multi-multi-millionaires. Uh, I, I made it a specific effort to bring Japanese women into the healthcare field and, and to provide opportunity for them. And, uh, and so at this time, I have an array of, I have about 10 of my protégés that I'm still in very close touch with. One in Connecticut, just retired. He was a hospital executive. Oh, one of the local boys that uh, I'm very proud of is uh, Gary Kajuara. At, President uh, and CEO of Kuakini Medical Center, uh, who says you arranged for a special internship for him, which really set the stage for what he does now. Yes. And has done for decades. Absolutely, absolutely. And he was at Queens Medical Center. He was a capable young man. And uh, so I'm proud of him today. Uh, quite proud of him. I think he's my only remaining uh, protege in the healthcare field, if I'm not mistaken. Well, what do you tell people? I mean, how do you, how do you give them new tools to, to, uh, to succeed? Leslie, I would be misleading you if I went into a big story about how I do and what I do. One thing. I come up, I pat you on the back, and I tell you, you know what? You're doing a great job. Even if you're not? <laughs> Even if you're not. So really, you've got to start with the most, most people need someone 
to stand beside them. And I'm a great one to walk up and put my arm around you and say, you know what, you're really looking good today. You're looking great. And, um, and we're in the same way. And each of those people are, are so appreciative that, that I think it doesn't make any difference how much you think you uh, have grown up in family, et cetera. Every person needs a pat on the back that simply says that you're doing a good job. Secondly, then if there is another one, I set very high expectations for them, very high, beyond they will say, I can't do that. I'm not capable of all of that. And every one of those protégés achieved that expectation. You didn't get a lot of pats on the back when you were a kid. You, you, there wasn't a lot of affection at all in your family, too no. much hard work. Or among any of the families. We all grew up without, yeah. without so, praise. So you know what it's like to yeah. have none. Yeah. That's why it's so important to me that uh, uh, whether there's this crew here, I pay attention to what they do. I watch them. Whomever they may be, I watch them. I selected my executives that were in my training programs. I created a whole training program that was called uh, Vertical Horizontal Participative Management and taught my people what that meant. Most people do not know what that means. And then taught them what that meant. And those people, so many of them have gone on to be very, very successful, not only in Hawaii, but on to the mainland and et cetera. And it's always to be there for them. If I ever say, I'll be your mentor, I'm your mentor. And I am there 24 hours a day for you. And so they can come to you with any little problem, something they might consider big, but you mm -hmm. don't, but you'll help them with always it? Always listen. Always listen. And, uh, uh, and I try never, uh, depending, try never to tell them what you should do. I say, you know, there's something. Have you thought about this? Uh, have you done any long-range thinking? What do you get out of mentoring people? Ah, the greatest excitement, satisfaction. I do it for free. I do it for free. Not only I would do it for free, but I do it for free. Will Henderson still keeps a sharp eye on the changing social economic climate of Hawaii, and he still contributes advice when people seek it. So it's a magnificent time of life and a trying time of life. It's a trying time of life? Yes, it is. How so? Well, think about it. We are all in a uh, recession again. Many, many people have lost their homes. Many, many people have migrated from uh, Hawaii to the mainland and to other places. Uh, many of our Hawaii graduates cannot get jobs. Uh, in the last two weeks, I've talked to at least 10. I tell them to take any kind of a job you can get. Doesn't matter what it is. And work at night and then still try to uh, do their job hunting in the daytime. And, and, and I've, I've tried to uh, also to explain to them, this is the one time in your life you're gonna learn to give back. And that is, you go to someone that as a company, you really want to work in their company and do as I did. I work for free. You tell them, I'll work for a year for free. If you'll give me an opportunity for a job in your company on the first one that comes along, they won't know what to think. Like the, coming from a young graduate that you're saying, I will work for free. Because you see, our young graduates don't work for free for years. They walked out and got a job anytime any place and more power to them. But that is uh, a downside that's now in our society and we're back. This is the repeat. Life repeats itself, history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. So what I grew up in, these young people are gonna have more, but their parents have lost their home, parents have lost their jobs, parents can't get a job because now they're now 45, 50 years old, etc. It's a trying time.
If you were to see Will Henderson doing his fitness routine, you'd have a hard time believing he's in his 90s. In fact, he may be in better physical shape than many people who are but a fraction of his age. I saw this amazing picture of you. It was an article written about you when you were 88 years old, and you were doing a, a one-handed push-up with a twist and holding onto it like a 20 or 30-pound ball with the other hand when you were 88. Yes. Like that happens every day? That happens every day. Still happens. I... Tell us about your fitness routine and how long <laughs> you've done it. Well, basically, fitness isn't just working out in, uh, in the gymnasium, so as to speak up. But um, I've, I've sort of been on that side of it, track, basketball, then uh, a lifeguard and then hanging out on the beach uh, for uh, 22 years here in Hawaii with uh, uh, all of the guys. And I've got the, uh, pure evidence that I did that because I get those skin cancers mm -hmm. and the di I go into the doctor, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and so uh, you do, it's important to do something all of the time. Uh, and if you do, you'll be surprised what you could do at 90 years of age. And so I've had long had uh, two separate programs. I have one at home that I do every morning, and that is a stretch program. And then, uh, you know, these rubber band things that you work with, I work with those. I have a lanai that's 180 feet around, so I, I do a, a run uh, four or five mornings a week, not very far, enough to, uh, to support flexibility, et cetera. And then I ride the elevator down and I walk up 12 flights of stairs without stopping. And that, that's my morning exercise. But I go to the Honolulu Club and to a second club that I have uh, joined. They're, they're quite different even though they are fitness clubs. In the Honolulu Club, I work out more with weights, and um, uh, a multiple machines that work many different parts of your body. And uh, I imagine you could still work to develop muscle, but when you're this old, you've lost your muscle uh, uh, and a lot of your strength, so you always work within what your muscles can do and what, your, uh, what weights you can lift and the likes of that. And now, what about uh, the other gym? Uh, the other one's exactly the same thing, but it's very small, it's quiet, and the, and the payoff is I can go there and in 45 minutes complete a workout. It's an hour and a half to two hours. Because you chat or because you all have to wait for time. machines? You've got okay. all of your friends and you, and that's a, a great part of my social life now because I have stopped uh, and gotten off of all of the board of directors I've been on and all of the groups, groups that I've participated in. And, and I've, I've brought it home to my commitment is to health. My health and your health. If I see friends that, that I won't uh, badger them, but I will suggest to them that you should be doing an exercise program mm -hmm. for your health and like that. But there's a payout, an unexpected payout. What is it? You've got all of these handsome, husky guys that are around there. And these ladies, they, they're, they're, some of them have been there for 30 years with me. And they are fit, and they're in good shape, and they are marvelous. And they come up to you and say, you are my hero. You are my idol. I want to be just like you. Some of them. The chuckle ones I got a part of are the ones that come up and they're about, they're overweight and like that. And they said, when I am your age, I want to be just like you. <laughs> but the way you get to be your age is to it's be working out. <laughs> for them. So you've always, you've always maintained a fitness regimen? No, I, not in the way that I do it now, but I was always sort of in in uh, athletics and swimmer. I was a lifeguard, as I said. And so you, you get to the point that 
you're committed. And it takes that commitment. And it becomes a joy that you are out there and you still can race the bus at 90 years old. <laughs> I gave that one up. <laughs> but you were doing it until recently, yeah, racing the bus. Two years ago, last time. Do you feel 92? I guess, I th do you feel the way you felt when you were 62 or 42? Feel better. Feel better. Think about it, I feel better. And his mental shape, equally impressive. Mahalo to Will Henderson for sharing his story with us, and mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho! For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. I was uh, in my car, uh, stopped at a red light, and a lady rear-ended me and almost killed me. And, and so my recovery started by going to Honolulu Club. And these big husky guys would come along, grab me by the seat of the pants and get me up on my feet because I couldn't get off, off the bench and get me up on my feet and said, you look wonderful, you look great. Yeah. <laughs>